Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. You can find him on Twitter at HMACBE. Welcome back to the show, Hilliard. Great to be on again. Hilliard, the U.S. Fed hiking rates once again. Is this... uh, Warranted, considering that U.S. inflation officially is now below 3%? You know, there's a great debate about how far the Fed should go. Usually the history of it is that the Fed will hike and hike and hike until um, something breaks. And um, what, some of us thought that the failure of three large banks in uh, earlier this year, about three months ago, was uh, definitely qualifies as something breaking. Uh, however, the Fed is looking at uh, other factors, and they, um, they, for instance, they find that uh, the economy is still pretty strong, and unemployment is still very low, and they're worried, obviously very worried about inflation. So even though the headline number was below 3%, the underlying numbers are showing you know, greater strength than that three, uh, sub-3% rate would, uh, would indicate, and I guess that's why they're continuing to go but the history of these things is that they usually go too far they obviously went too far when they kept rates so low and basically at zero percent for so many years they kept them low for way too long and the odds are that they'll go too far the other way and they'll go too high and uh, and until a recession starts they never want to admit it but basically the way to get inflation under control is to, to force the economy into a recession and um and that, and they probably won't stop until they do that. And and of course, with the way uh, economic numbers work, um, they're reported late. They're often they're long behind reality. We might already be in a recession. Certainly, uh, Germany's in a recession. Um, England's probably in a recession. Canada might be in a recession. Um, who knows if the U.S. when after a few re- revisions of numbers. Um, you know, a few months from now, we'll look back and say, hey, you know what? The recession started in in the spring of 2023. We just didn't know we were in a recession. My little sister uh, has an interesting note. She works at a co-op store in Peace River, Alberta, which for the curious is 500 K north of Edmonton. It's north. Anyway, she is noticing that customers at her store are handing in older bank notes in other words they're going into their secret stash to survive (laughs) right now (laughs) yeah i you know there's there's the next thing you know they'll be bringing in jars full of pennies and asking ask you to count them all out (laughs) but but these are older bank notes yeah older bank notes from the 60s and 70s yeah i mean you know imagine how much the better the the government benefits from people taking those notes and then just tucking them away in a, in a drawer somewhere. And, uh, and we've all got them and it's a huge amount of money. That's, uh, that's sort of like yeah. free to the economy that, uh, uh, but when people are desperate, they'll do desperate things. And, um, you know, you could sort of, you could look at pawn shops and see if the people are turning in their, some of their older valuables in order to get uh, some money and some cash and, uh, but we've got we've got a little bit better indicators than that. Uh, we can look at um, things like credit card uh, defaults, and those are starting to soar now. Um, auto loans. It's really interesting with auto loans because the interest rate on auto loans has been sh- shooting higher and higher, and the length of the loan is now, on average, up to something like eighty-four months. So, obviously, people are very stretched. A thousand dollar a month 
uh, payments on, on auto, automobile purchase loans is becoming pretty standard. And people just, you know, with the combination of mortgage interest rates going up 40, 50, 60 percent, uh, if variable rates get, um, get renewed at the higher rate, uh, and things like auto loans going up, credit card payments being behind, um, at some point, uh, you know, a recession would, would, would hit. And that, that should be the way that it should work. Uh, but, you know, it, it could get drawn out because, uh, in this new era, when, when everybody is, is sort of trying to shield the, the average person from the reality of the situation, uh, the lenders are being very, very, uh, generous with their terms. Uh, people are being allowed to extend the term. I mean, there's people that have mortgage repayment terms of 50, 60, 80, 70, 80, 90 years now because the banks have, have, have not increased the payments to reflect the higher interest rates yet. So, so, uh, maybe people are, are still walking around thinking that they can afford a lifestyle that they, they can't afford. And, it, you know, it's, it's, you know the the Federal Reserve raising the rates is is trying to get at that a little bit in terms of we we allowed people to borrow too much we allowed them to pay interest rates that were way too low and now we have to we have to do something about that um, but you know it's 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 it, it could be very harsh for some people. Now uh, I've just received an email from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation and they say the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation has dished out. $75 million in bonuses since the beginning of 2020. More than 90% of its workforce has been getting a bonus in recent years. CMHC claims it's driven by just one goal, housing affordability for all. However, according to the Royal of the Royal Bank of Canada, buying a home has never been so unaffordable. So really should a uh, hundred or you know millions and tens of millions of dollars be given to CMHC in the way of bonuses. It seems to me they've been an abject failure. Well, you know they they say that housing affordability is their goal, but actually, and it's not their fault because they they um, they don't have control over these things. Uh, but actually, they've contributed to uh, making housing unaffordable. And the way they contributed to it is when they issue the insurance for this for the uh, loan, what they do is they say to the bank, oh, you can lend, well, I, there used to be no limit. You could go above a million. Now the limit is a million. You can lend a million dollars to a young couple. They can't really afford to take out a million dollar loan, but the lender can do it because uh, the CMHC will, will guarantee the loss if, if, if the couple turns out to not be able to repay that loan. So so if, if you accept the premise, which I believe is is correct, that house prices will rise to the level that the banks are willing to lend at, then the CMHC has been is fundamentally um, uh, encouraging lenders to lend much larger amounts of money than people really would normally be allowed to borrow. Uh, if the bank ha- was worried about the the loss on that loan, if there's no insurance on it for the C- from the CMHC or the other um, mortgage insurance companies. They would say, "Oh no, we're not going to lend a million dollars to that young couple. We're, the most we can lend them is three hundred thousand, right?" And then, so then, what would happen? House prices would have to come down to three hundred thousand. That, that's the only way that works. And 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 we know that partly because in Germany, that's exactly the way it works. You have to walk in with a 40 percent down payment, and the bank sits down with you and goes through all of your financial statements for the last couple of years to see if you're uh, able to save money. If you're if you're a good manager of your financial affairs, and then the bank becomes kind of like a partnership with with the home buyer, in order to help them get through the next thirty forty years. But in Canada, it's completely the opposite. They, the bank doesn't even care. Is well, once that once that, and and the irony of it is that it's the home buyer that pays the premium on the insurance. So the home buyer pays the insurance premium, which means day one they're they're actually underwater on their mortgage. Their their loan to value is 104 percent or something like that of of the of the value of the house. Uh, once the the bank doesn't care because if the, if the if the couple is unable to to repay that loan, the bank just goes to the CMHC and says, "Give us give us back our loss. We, we're claiming our insurance." And so it's a really it's the only country in the world that I could find when I was writing my book um, that has such a generous. Uh, 
option. There is one in the U.S. that's similar, but it's much smaller. And uh, there's a month, there's a yearly uh, insurance premium. So people get out, try and get out of it as quickly as they can because the insurance premium is quite, quite onerous, and it encourages people to uh, to try and uh, relieve themselves of the obligation of paying the insurance premium. But in Canada, it's a one-time payment. It lasts for the length of the mortgage, and uh, and everybody is happy. The only problem will be if if defaults start to soar. Uh, CMHC will not have the money to pay the banks the um, the losses on their on their mortgages that they've handed out, and then CMHC will have to go to the government to get their capital replenished, and that'll be interesting. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll become very political at some point uh, when that has to if it, if and when that has to happen. Right, and uh, we do have, I guess, in the not too distance future a federal election ca- coming up in canada the prime minister shuffled the cabinet but the main faces remain the main faces and the other 30 or 40 or 50 other uh, minions he has uh, you they were nameless before and i think they're nameless now yeah i don't think most people uh really could name even I, they might be able to name two cabinet ministers if that and a lot of them can't name any so uh, they, they don't really care about that. They do what they do care about, it, though, is their is their price of their house, the, mm. the monthly payment on their mortgage, the monthly payment on their car loan, and um, and that's been going up. Uh, you know, in a in a in a in a universe where mortgages usually uh, mature after five years in terms of the payment schedule, uh, not the amortization of the full mortgage, say twenty five thirty years, but the rate is set for five years or less. Uh, 20% of, of, uh, at least 20% of the mortgages are up for renewal every year. Uh, and when, when you add in variable rate mortgages, it could be as much as 40 or 50% are up for renewal every, every year for the next couple of years. So that, that kind of hit is going to be, uh, really noticeable for people. And, um, the rate increases started about a year and a half ago at the end of, uh, the end of 2021, early 2022. So, uh, we're sort of a year and a half into this, and um, so people will really start to see. Uh, and I, I do people pay attention to that? I don't know. I don't. I don't, I don't know if they do. I think I suspect they, they. You know, they took out the mortgage when it was two percent or one and a half percent, and their payments are fifteen hundred a month. They're they're going to be shocked to find out that the payments now are twenty five hundred a month or even three thousand a month. And um, some of them will be able to handle it, and some of them won't be able to handle it. But we, we don't we won't know until the the full impact. But we're, unless they they continue to uh, do some of the the policies that they're currently doing, which is extending the amortization periods, um, if 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 that if that doesn't prevail, if that's only a temporary um, situation, uh, we should be able to tell within a year or two. Uh, out of all those people that bought homes in the last, especially the ones that bought homes from 2020 on, how many of them were on the edge and couldn't really afford higher payments, and how how many of them are fine? I mean, the people that bought 20 years ago, uh, unless they refinance their mortgages, they should be in great shape, mm-hmm. and then the new interest rates won't won't kill them. But it's the ones that have, have bought more recently in the last five years that uh, uh, they had to stretch to buy those houses because the prices were so high, and um, if, if of course, if a recession comes in, their jobs might not be as, as secure as they th- as they thought, and that's where you get that uh, that uh, crisis, economic crisis, uh, caused by uh, an, an unusual credit crunch, which we haven't had, by the way, in Canada since the 1990s. So we don't we don't know. Most of the people in charge now. Uh, have no experience with that kind of stuff because they haven't been around long enough to remember what it was like. Mm-hmm. And you have to, you have to really go back to the early 1980s to see something as, as big as what we're currently facing in terms of, uh, when the interest rates got up to 19% and, uh, uh, people were losing their homes. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, who knows how, how it's going to be handled. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the reason it's so hard to predict is because you don't know what the government, how the government is going to react to, to uh, a bunch of people uh, being un- unable to pay their, their debts, uh, and, especially their more. Yeah. Uh, back in 1981, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, a little town, 45 minutes outside of Regina. A uh, developer couldn't sell 
his uh, block of houses he had just built. As you said, mortgage rates were at 18% at the time. So he started to bulldoze them. Unfortunately, his wife was in house number four after he'd wrecked three, and she was in the living room when he started to rip that house apart, and the police had to put a warning shot through the windshield of his caterpillar, uh, of his uh, front-end loader, to stop his rampage. <laughs> and then and then for a month, people from all over Saskatchewan were circling around, because I only lived a block away from there, were circling around to take a look at this damage, and the, the bulldozer was still halfway into the house with a bullet hole just above where the driver's head would have been. That's what can happen when mortgage rates go nuts. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, when is this uh, bursting bubble going to hit the scene? Are we going to see a uh, rapid decline in real estate prices next year, I think, because of this, where people are going to be selling their homes at uh, desperate prices? You know, it's hard to... I, obviously, uh, my my uh, my alerting to the housing bubble bursting uh, seven years ago was way too early. Uh, so I'm reluctant to make a timing yeah. prediction, but but uh, you mentioned just now something interesting, which is uh, related to the housing bubble bursting, and that is house builders. So house builders, the way house builders work is they if they can get the financing, they keep building, and they, they don't, they can't really predict macroeconomic trends. Uh, you know, who, who can really? Uh, nobody knows when the housing bubble is going to burst. And what happens is the... Uh, they, they tend to notice that if they build 20 houses this year and they could have sold 40, and then if they built 40 next year and they could have sold 60, well, the third or fourth year or the fifth year that that happens to them, they try and build 100 houses. And then what happens is they can only, you know, when the, when the tide turns, then they can only sell 80 of those 100 houses and they go bankrupt. And that has been so long since that happened that most home builders are extremely confident. And they don't have any kind of a, a, a brake pedal close to the. All they have is a gas pedal, and uh, so when people say, "Well, uh, you know," and they do say this to to me, they say, "Well, you know, your prediction might be right, but it might be wrong." But what you've forgotten is that when people see prices going down, um, they won't sell their house; they'll just take it off the market. And that, and there's some evidence that that's what's happening now with the listings being as low as they are, their record low levels in some some cities. People obviously are looking at the, at the weak prices that we've experienced for for probably about a year now in Canada, and say, "Well, I'm not going to sell my price because my neighbor sold their house for two million, and I'm there's no way I'm accepting 1.6 million because my house is better than their house." So they sit on the house waiting for for the prices to go back up, and then eventually maybe they get convinced to sell at an even lower price if they're forced to sell for some reason, or if if uh, if the kids get involved, who knows? But whatever scenario. Uh, but what's missing in that is the new home builders. So the new home builders, they are forced to sell uh, either because they they've uh, overcommitted and they borrowed too much money and they have to sell the houses at a at a loss in order to just repay the loans, or if they really are stubborn. What happens is the lender moves in and takes over the project and the lender doesn't care. The lender just says, okay, just sell them for whatever we can get for them and let's get this resolved. So, uh, it would be the new home builder, whether it be, uh, single family homes or condos. And there's an interesting thing in condos, uh, called pre-construction assignment sales where you could see force people forced to, uh, to, uh, sell, uh, unlike the single family, the older single family home owner who might just pull a, the house off the market, so that's the um, that's the thing to watch, and that will be a really good predictor of if we're starting into the into the you know so far we've just had a mild downturn in the market. I think the official numbers from CREA are like if prices are down ten percent. At the worst, they were down twenty percent. Those numbers are somewhat massaged by by the uh, by the by the people that put out the index, but um, but that's not really a bursting of the bubble. That's just a pause. 
what we would really have to see would be 30 or 40 percent to be a bubble bursting. And we wouldn't see that unless uh, we get into a situation where uh, house, home builders, new home builders are forced to sell or, or other people are forced to sell because the lender gets involved and goes through bank, you know, foreclosure or power sale, that sort of thing. And, and so far, whether the government and the lenders have, have talked about this, I suspect they have. Uh, there's a been, been a decision at the policy level made to to hold off on forcing people to uh, make those those drastic choices and you know help them get through this has generally been the been the the um, the leadership that's that's been uh, put out there. So well, how much longer that lasts, I don't know. I've, I'm watching closely. The um, there's a thing in the U.S. We don't have. The data in Canada are not nearly as good as the U.S. But in the U.S., they have some pretty good data. There's one called a Senior Loan Officer Survey, and it's financial conditions. And they take they do a survey of 17 large banks, 100 smaller banks, and they ask them, are conditions tighter than they used to be? In other words, is it more difficult to get a loan, or are they the same, or are they looser? And so lately, the number of, of uh, banks that have gone and answered that question the question on our conditions, financial conditions tighter, uh, has gone up from something like 25 or 30 percent to 45 or 50 percent, a huge increase in that, in that uh, number. And that's because the banks are, you know, after what happened with those three banks that failed in March, uh, the banks are getting much more uh, careful about who they lend money to and how much they lend in the U.S. And, uh, that's a sign that, uh, the credit, uh, conditions are going to get difficult and that's basically that's this is what drives the housing market is uh two things availability of credit and cost of credit well the cost of credit has gone up for sure we know mortgage rates now are six and a half seven percent so it's just now it just becomes the availability of credit are banks foreclosing on people or are they doing what i call massaging the conditions of the mortgage to keep the people in their house they are helping them stay in their home. And uh, whether it's an official rule, I know that um, the regulator, OSFI, the Office of Superintendent of Financial Institutions, put out a uh, uh, some some uh, requests for feedback on some changes that they're expecting. The, the, the feedback period is for September. And, of course, you know, who knows what the, you know, if, the, way, the way it goes is very simply – they ask the banks, what should we do? Should we tighten conditions? And the banks say, well, you could do that. Uh, but you realize if you do that, then a whole bunch of people are going to lose their homes. And then, so then the, the government says, well, we don't want to do that, especially not, you know, immediately prior to an election. So what else can we do? And so there's that. And, um, and then I think the banks too, uh, uh, are, are, have adopted a, a, a much less, a much, gentler kind of a demeanor with with people that have borrowed a bunch of money partly because they, they the bank is the one that encouraged them to borrow a lot of money the bank told them they could afford to borrow that much money so uh it's kind of hard to turn around the next month and say wait a minute uh we have to call that loan because you've, you've borrowed too much and the guy says well the borrower says well you're the one that told me to borrow that <laughs> it's not my fault and uh Anyway, that's a, that's an interesting discussion. In fact, in the, the only time, it's, as far as I know, the only time it's really happened on a widespread basis was in the early 80s when these rates went up to 19%. And the banks in Alberta, I don't know about Ontario, but the banks in Alberta, they actually brought in new people because you can't have the, the loan officer that was the one that was encouraging people to take more money uh, a few months before or a couple of years before, uh, the friendly banker, was replaced by the nasty banker, the the one with the sharp pencil and the uh, eye shades and all that. And uh, those those bankers uh, were brought in to to explain to people that they they had to come up with some more money right away, or else their house was going to be seized and it was going to be foreclosed on, and they were going to lose their lose their house. So um, sometimes that you know I haven't seen any sign of that yet. It's we're still in the first phase where the people are. are Basically, um, uh, the lenders are acting as if they're your friend still. So <laughs> I don't know. It's going to be a shock when the when the when the bank changes to the to the nasty version of that of that scenario. The real estate situation in China. How bad is it? 
So China's gone through. I, you and I talked a couple of years ago about a company called China Evergrande, which is one of the largest real estate developers. So they got into trouble, uh, big trouble. And they were huge. I mean, they owed a total of 300 billion U.S. dollars. Um, it's just Im- impossible to uh, fathom that, that amount of money. Uh, and what they did was they built apartments pr- primarily for Chinese people, residential in the, in real estate. And basically, uh, the way it works in China is that people tend to buy those apartments. They keep them as an investment. They don't actually move into them. So the, the the apartments are sold with bare walls, no finishing, no furnishings, and no finishings, and uh, and they they tend to hold their value at least they have up until now, uh, and they just kept building. And there was these stories about you know ghost cities with you know hundreds of high rise towers that people had invested in, and uh, as long as the price kept rising, people were happy to just sit and hold on to those units. And but now what happened was. Um, China Evergrande and now a few of the other ones have have been unable to complete those projects. So they took the money. Oh, and the other thing that that's, that's true about China is that uh, unlike in Canada, um, when they buy those apartments, they put up the full cost. So the uh, costs are lower, obviously, over there. But if it's a two hundred thousand dollar apartment, they have to put up the full two hundred thousand dollars when they when they, before the before the apartment is built. So China Evergrande was able to expand quite rapidly and. Uh, they had all this free money uh, uh, of subst- uh, essentially from these investors. Uh, but when the credit crunch hit, and part of it was triggered by the government, the government brought in some new policies a couple of years ago that uh, all of the big developers had to meet certain mm. uh, red lines. Uh, they, it turned out China couldn't, uh, China Evergrande couldn't complete these apartments. So initially when you and I talked about this, it was two years ago, um, the China Evergrande was the only company that was in this situation. Now, pretty much all of the uh, developers in China are in the same position. They, they're all in trouble. And the way we, the way we measure it is by the, the value, the quality of their loans that they've bought, the money that they've borrowed in American dollars from foreign investors. And that, that's a very large amount of money. In the China Evergrande's case, it was $20 billion U.S. that they had borrowed out of the $300 billion that they owed was owed to foreign investors. Um, the domestic stuff can be taken care of with help from the government, and it's, it's in the local currency, but those foreign loans are the problem. And now several other, including Country Garden Holdings, which is the largest developer in China, hmm. have, uh, have, have we've seen that their bond values have plummeted, which means people are, 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 are thinking that they might not be able to repay those, those foreign dollar loans. So it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an example of a, of a bubble bursting. And it's interesting to watch because the government of China is obviously more involved in, 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 uh, in the private sector than, uh, we're used to in North America. So, um, so they, even they though have been unable to, uh, do anything about stopping this bursting of this bubble. They, they keep bringing out new policies. The, this week they brought out another set of new policies, but, uh, but it's it's a very difficult situation. Once once people uh, start defaulting on loans, everybody gets scared, and uh, nobody's willing to lend. And uh, buyers of new apartments are unwilling to buy. Mm. And uh, so the 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 news that came out this week was China. So in the last two years, China Evergrande never released their financial reports, and they finally released them this week, and they said that they. Um, Lost eighty-one billion dollars U.S. U.S. dollars over that two-year period. So that was a bit of a shock, more than a bit of a shock to the market. And then, and then the account, uh, the accounting firm, which was a large international accounting firm, had been replaced by a smaller uh, local accounting firm. And the local firm said, "We cannot guarantee, we cannot um, give full assurance on the on the uh, validity of these results uh, because we didn't have access to all the data." So even that number, 81 billion, might be understated because the accounting firm was unable to uh, confirm it. So it's uh, that's the way it goes when the when there's that, that amount of debt. Um, and um, so we we would we would be uh, we would expect in Canada if something similar would happen, the government would get very involved. But it may be that the government is unable to um, unable to stop. The uh, the unwinding of 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 the uh, of the boom that 
is turning into a bust. Well, I, and I would be worried if China's economy gets into real, real trouble, that their reaction to that is going to be invade Taiwan because the classic thing for a despotic leadership to do is to create a war to take people's minds off their bad economy. The classic example would be Argentina invading the Falkland Islands back in the 1980s. Their economy yeah, I, was in the dumper, and they invaded. Yeah, a distraction would be very useful for the Chinese government right now. They, they, uh, you know, they're they're struggling with a lot of different things, and um, and and you know they're making a lot of progress too in some areas. Like, for instance, they um, they're leading in electric vehicle sales by far. Uh, several, uh, one of their companies, BYD. Is uh, is rivaling Tesla in terms of the number of cars sold. They're actually exporting Chinese battery electric vehicles to Germany, which is shocking <laughs> to the highest degree. Um, and uh, I don't think that'll last much longer. Uh, some of the some of the German uh, car makers are starting to make an electric vehicle offering. Mm. Um, but that, and and they're also building an, an immense amount of solar and wind power in uh, production in China. Although they still need to make new coal plants as well because their electricity demand is is still growing rapidly. So it's it's a mixture over there, and I I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, count China out in terms of future GDP growth. But the residential investment sector was such a large part of the economy over there as it is in Canada. That going through a a, a, a slowdown or a, or a or a crash like they are in that sector has to drag the whole economy down at least for for a period of time. The difference though in China though is that they have the ability to ramp up their their non um, residential sector uh, in infrastructure and business and exports and all that kind of stuff. Whereas in Canada, we're more reliant on consumer spending. Consumer spending in Canada, the U.S. is 65, 70% of the economy. So if there's a, a bursting of the housing bubble in Canada, uh, that's really going to hurt our economy because, uh, obviously consumers are not spending as much if they're, if they're, if they're losing their home or if the value of their home is going down, they can't borrow as much, that sort of thing. Whereas in China, um, the consumer spending is a, is, a, is a much smaller. It's only like thirty-five or forty percent of the of the economy. So um, there's lots of other levers that the Chinese government can pull to keep things going. So I wouldn't cut them out. The one thing that would really hurt China, though, is is a um, slowdown in the U.S. consumer because a lot of their economy depends on making stuff for for us in North America and sending it to us to push that button on the Amazon and the next day the item shows up it comes from China unless there's a strike at the port and uh that's uh that's a big part of their economy if that ever slowed down and they, and it would be and it would slow down in the recession then China would be uh, really struggling they'd have a um a two two major headwinds to their economy well with the US trying to bring factories home from China and be more self-reliant are the Chinese ner uh, nervous about that I'm sure they are and uh, they they uh they they had a they had a um a plan which was announced 10 years ago almost 10 years ago called Made in 2025 which is uh, they wanted to they didn't want to buy anything uh from elsewhere they wanted to have everything uh, sourced from China, so they that that helps with the, being so reliant on exports. They're now making stuff for themselves, and so if they if they open up a new uh, nuclear plant or a new coal fired plant, or uh, they've already done it in solar and wind, they make all their all their stuff themselves. But but companies like Siemens from Germany and a, a um, uh, so, some uh, some of the other uh, big engineering companies in in uh, Europe. They still sell big power equipment um, transformers and things like that, and China is building out that infrastructure very rapidly. Um, but very soon, by 2025, the mandate is to make make all of that stuff locally. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're able to do it. The other big push that they're doing in China is uh, artificial intelligence. They they uh, they were talking about that internally. At least two or three years ago, they were putting a big push on in artificial intelligence. So now whether they're able to match uh, the U.S. companies like NVIDIA, I don't know. But um, but it, that that helps China, but it will also hurt them a lot to lose uh, 
some of this manufacturing. But I can't imagine all that manufacturing shifting to the U.S. I just don't think the U.S. and Canada have the ability to make that stuff the way China does. I mean, the, the, the cost, the cost alone would be a major uh, factor in prohibiting a big transfer of manufacturing from, from China or now Vietnam and some of those other countries to, to North America. Our costs would be much, much higher for, for some of that stuff. And, the, and, and quite frankly, the Chinese are just better at it, right? So it doesn't make sense for us to try and uh, duplicate that. Hilliard, anything else we should be keeping a close eye on right now? Well, the one thing that happened uh, yesterday was, uh, as you and I have discussed, I've, I've been a Tesla owner for quite a while now, since 2016. And, uh, and I'm on my third model. And one of the tricks about owning a Tesla is if you, if you want to get the fully self-driving, it's, a, it's an optional extra you have to pay. And when you upgrade your Tesla, a very annoying thing happens. It's, you have to uh, pay, you have to buy it again. So you buy, you pay for the fully self-driving, which isn't really here yet. Elon Musk keeps saying it's going to be here by the end of the year, but that's, it's been saying that for five years now. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you pay this money for something that isn't quite ready yet. I mean, I've been using it, but it's still um, not ready for prime time, if you like. Uh, and I've bought it twice. Like I paid it once when I upgraded the first time, and and then in 2021 I paid it again when I upgraded uh, to the new model that's called the Plaid. And uh, so anyway, I got a phone call last night. It said, "If you want to upgrade, we'll let you transfer the fully self-driving. You won't have to pay the fees on the new on the new car." And it sounded like it was the phone call. Sounded like it was coming from a room full of people, you know, like a telemarketing. Um, and I thought, "Wow, what is this?" Uh, are they are they are their sales slowing? And they they know that existing Tesla owners are probably the most likely people to buy another Tesla. Uh, I don't know, but I, 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 the problem is, I said, well, I, I said to the the caller, I said, well, I've already got the model Plaid. There isn't another model until you guys bring out a Roadster or something. There isn't anything I can upgrade to. So, so don't call me. <laughs> but with this offer that I can't take advantage of, but uh, but maybe it's a sign that. Um, that uh, vehicle sales are slowing because certainly um, that that statistic that we talked about a minute ago that the payments are now up to a thousand a month that's going to slow a lot of people down in terms of trying to buy a new car. Mm. Hilliard, thank you so much for chatting with us. Nice to chat with you. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. If you have any questions for Hilliard or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at House Street. We're also on Facebook. Maybe Twitter's called X. We're not sure yet. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.